What's up, man? How you doing today? How you doing? Hey, I'm just trying to check. What? I'm just trying to check. What's that? I'm just trying to check. What's that? Okay, so I'm plug this, plug this one. No, no. You're sitting up there. So this goes okay, in. Doing multiple games. This goes in the game. red. Yeah. <laughs> you can do some charge drills. I like charge drills. Yeah, charge drills. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 the fifth word in this word spelled stand backwards stand while standing on your head. Go! <laughs> it's so just me. <laughs> you know, do it to where you can only search with your left hand. Yeah, get all that. And then you have to read it with your right hand. No one's done much. That one, no, that would be good. That's one. There we go. Megan, Center one. So it's skip one. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. 
here is everybody recovered nope. nope yeah this year everybody's like we worked on saturday well some of us worked on saturday but we're not used to working like friday night uh i don't know have we ever worked friday night never maybe like the very first year so it's been it's been a while but it's good to be here uh you know we had to drag brother gill out of out of his bed just to come saturday morning just to work and it was uh we don't know what was going to happen, but uh, we're glad that it's all done. We got it ready, and uh, but it's been a, it's been a good week. Now I was told it's like yeah we'll get you up at 10:20. It's like we scratched that now it's like 10:05. I'm like okay, so now we might have to do sword drills or something. I was told to come up with something from Pastor Stephen to come up with a game or to a way to make it interesting. He said we should do sword drills where you find like insects in the Bible. Does that sound sound normal? We've done it. Okay, we'll do a sword drill. What are your What are your sword drill rules? Everybody does it different. You have to like have by the spine, in your lap, hold it up. Okay, is it arms extended? Do we Do you make people do that? We'll just do a sword drill. I, 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 this is on the fly. Why don't we find an insect in the Bible? <laughs> Arm up. Go. I can't even verify any of these, but. <laughs> You'll be able to see Pastor Stephen after Sunday, after family hour for a prize. Mariah? Uh, the locusts have no king. We'll take that. The locusts have no king. What's the reference? Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30? Uh, 26. 26. You kind of started to yeah. waver there. Did you make that up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, what else can we do here? Okay, raise your, raise your Bibles. We'll do one. Okay, here. We'll do Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, verse 14, the fifth word. Go. Okay. I'm going to give it to your mom just because I have to, but next time just say it. I was like, I guess I should have called on like. Harmony's like, I got it, and then I just didn't call on her. <laughs> okay, let's do, okay, put, put them up. Okay, here. Turn it upside down. Eh, like, you have, to be, you have to be looking at it upside down, okay? 
so you have to you have to be turning it upside down to find it. And this is all this has all been given to me from Pastor Stephen. Again, if you win a if you win a round, you get to go see Pastor Stephen for a prize afterwards. You're welcome. I put that on you. <laughs> okay, let me find what we're going to be looking for. Second Kings chapter six. Verse 6. Go. Six, six. Yes. Start reading the verse. Start reading the verse. I can't read it upside down. What? You can the man of God said. That is correct. Okay, here. So we had. I don't know who's won before. Uh, Mariah, Mrs. Summers, and then is it Peyton? Okay, I got it right. Sweet. <laughs> and then let's do, we've got two girls of one, one boys one. How many do you normally do? How many sword drills? 50? Okay, we'll keep doing, let's do it all. We'll do five. So we got three winners, we'll do two. Okay, you have to do it one-handed with one hand behind your back and turn with one hand. This is all getting, getting uh, suggestions. Not the Bible behind you. Just you, you can only flip it one. Yeah, yeah. Not, you got to turn with it behind you and find it. So you, you're going to have one hand. You can only flip with one hand. So you have to get on your lap and then turn quickly. We'll do Lamentations chapter 3, verse 5, the last word. Lamentations 3, 5, the last word. Go. Anybody has a wide margin? You are not liking having a wide margin right now. No phones, I'm sure that's a rule, right? No phones, no tablets. Travail, okay. We got Brother Brian. Okay, here we have one more. Two, oh, this is great. We've had two boys win, two girls win. Do we, are you still doing like boys versus girls during family school? Last year there was like a boys versus girls and you're not doing that? Okay, I can't throw out points then, so. So there's no like teams or anything? Okay, fine. Oh. We'll do one more again. See Pastor Stephen after for a prize. Whatever, the, whatever they have. Okay. Um, put all this for all the kids. No adults. All the kids right now. Put your Bible up. Uh, we're going to cap it at 18. Hezekiah 3.5. Go. <laughs> Say it. Who's still looking? Does anyone stop looking? Okay, okay, everybody, so everybody's looking up at, hey, wait a second. It took you a little bit longer than I thought it would be. Okay, Brother Brian, you might need to do the, the uh, Books of the Bible song next week just to make sure that we uh, cover that basis. No Hezekiah. Don't be looking for that anymore. Okay, I was just, a, that was a test. We'll do the last one finally. Four, 18 and under. Micah, five, one, go. Yes, you, Becca got it. So girls beat the guys. Okay, so boo. Everyone's still sort of asleep, but we'll just have to go with it. Okay, we can start turning to 1 Samuel. We'll be in 1 Samuel. We'll start in chapter 10. We'll kind of be jumping around. We'll, we'll jump over to uh, 1 Chronicles, but we'll be, uh, or we'll just kind of jump around. We're going to be looking at... Um, Different. Uh, we're going to do kind of like a comparison between two people. If you're thinking of First Samuel, who does anyone want to guess? Any kid want to guess who I might be comparing this morning? If you're thinking about, does anybody know off the top of your head what First Samuel? Who might be in First Samuel, and then who I might be kind of comparing between? Anybody want to take a guess? No. Saul and who else? There's a second person. I'm going to compare him to someone. I'm going to compare Saul to who? Brother Brian, what'd you say? Yes, I'm going to be comparing Saul and David this morning. I was, uh, there's a thing that I'm going through, or I guess it's a daily 
reading plan that sometimes turns into multiple days for one day, but we'll see, you know, I'm not always, it's sometimes difficult while driving a lot to get all of the chapters in, but we, uh, the, this reading plan, um, I was going through and as I was listening to it, it was going through, obviously you hit Saul and David and there's some, th some thoughts that I was curious about, so I was going and looking at it and so that kind of prompted me looking at this and it is where majority of the thoughts came from this morning. Because uh, if you think about it, uh, for the adults in the room, do you know what the phrase uh, "on paper it looks good"? What that? What everyone? What, uh, what is "on paper it looks good"? Was was someone oh, well, on paper it looks good? What are they trying to say? It doesn't. It, it looks like it should work, but whenever it starts happening in reality, it doesn't. It doesn't pan out. It doesn't work good. Well, I would say a lot of people in uh, at that time would say, on paper, Saul looked like what a great king should be, but when it panned out. I don't think Saul. We would consider Saul a great king. You know, he. First uh, Samuel chapter ten uh, is where I'm at. First Samuel ten verses twenty three through twenty four. It talks about how what Saul looked like in, in, in reality. When everyone was looking at him, everybody's like, "Hey, this is what a king should look like." First Samuel ten verses twenty three through twenty four says, "And they ran and fetched him, talking about Saul when they were getting ready to make him king. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any uh, any of the people from his shoulders and upward." And Samuel Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted and said, God save the king. Whenever they were looking at Saul, they said, There is none like him. You know, on paper, Saul looked like he should be a great king. But we, if we uh, look back or we, we think about the story, he did not turn out to be a great king. And like, why is that? What happened? And you look at David. We can we the the famous phrase about David. What is that? What what was what's said about David that is like n m the most known about him? He was a man after God's own heart. What happened when you look at King Saul, the very first king in Israel, who you know again on paper it looked like he'd be a great king. He's head and shoulders above everybody. Whose people they were looking at. They said this is going to be a great king. It did not turn out well. What happened? And then you look at uh, the next king, David, who was a man after God's own heart. What, and we may not be able to cover everything, and this is not going to be some deep uh, investigation. But I think there's a couple things that I saw just from like uh, partly, uh, part of it is like maybe their first test as king, one of their first tests as king. And something else that I noticed that, uh, that David uh, talked about when he took over and just some things as I was looking at it that we we can, we can see some issues that maybe David or that Saul did not prioritize that David did and what kind of made his maybe uh, besides uh, the disobedience and different things that Saul did. But if we know anything about uh, King Saul and King David, they both disobeyed. They both sinned. What was the uh, kids in the room? What was the one big sin that King David committed that I'd say maybe he's most famous for committing? Any kids? Julia, David and Bathsheba. Yes, he, and he. Who did he? Who did he have killed because of that? Do, do you remember Bathsheba? That was that is correct. She got. Do you know Bathsheba's husband? His name. What's his name? Uriah the Hittite. She had him killed. That is probably the thing that he's most famous for. They, so they both sinned. We, we know that we can both go through that. But we're going to look at maybe how they reacted, how they uh, were, um, how they lived, and just different things that, you know, what made the difference? What made it look like Saul, you know, he should be a great king. And what, what were some things that we can see that did not happen? And then maybe some things that did happen. We'll look at that this morning and then kind of just go through and uh, uh, just try to the time that we have left and then um, get you out. What time are you usually done going upstairs? It's about 10.50, 10.55, yeah. quarter till, 10.45, okay. We'll, we'll, we're going to pray, then we're going to jump into the lesson this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be able to gather here this morning, that you brought us all uh, here safely. 
Uh, Lord, just thank you for the time that we can have to open up your word. Please just be with us over the next few minutes that we would um, hear from you. Lord, please speak to our hearts. Lord, I have nothing uh, valuable in of myself to say. Please just allow your word to speak to us and allow your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts that we would be changed by uh, your word and everything that's done in this service and the service to follow that we would honor and uh, please you and give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you would turn over to uh, 1 Chronicles uh, 13, that's where we're going to start. So we, we, when we were in 1 Samuel 10, we were just seeing here, hey, you know, they, people were looking at Saul and said, hey, he is what a great king should look like. Uh, the, the children of Israel, if you would know the story, they were led by Moses through the wilderness. They got to the promised land, were led by Joshua, and then they started uh, going through their cycle of uh, sinning. Then they go to, uh, they'd be, go into slavery to a captive nation. Then they would, they would cry out and say, God, help us. He would send a judge, and they would then deliver them. And they kind of keep doing this cycle. And so for a while, for many years, they were just ruled by judges. They were rule, and you know God was still their king, and that's what He wanted. To, he God wanted to be their king, and said, you know, I want to have a prophet, a man of God, who will go to you and tell you my words. But I still want to be basically your king. And eventually, the uh, the children of Israel said, we don't want that anymore. We want a king, which is what happened. Samuel was very was not happy, but Samuel was the last prophet, really last uh, prophet that they had. And then it went into they were now being led by kings, and Saul was the very first king. We saw what he, uh, again, he was the first king that they got. This is who it, maybe what they thought a king should look like. Again, it did not pan out. And we come here in First Chronicles 13. This is kind of, I'd say this is uh, one area that David put uh, a lot of emphasis on that Saul did not, as we can see, just what the verse is going to tell us. And this is one thing that we have to be careful about. If we, if we want to go about in our lives, what we want to have, uh, what we want to place emphasis on. Um, verse, uh, first, first Chronicles 13, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. David, uh, Saul has passed away, and they are now nominating David to be king, and he is starting to, uh, the, one of the very first things that we read about after he becomes king and after, um, after it's been settled, we come here in First Chronicles 13, it says, And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader, and David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, in that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves. What that verse is saying, kids, is he says, get everybody. Let's, let's get everybody. In verse 3 it says, And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. That, that right there seems like a pretty big... Uh, fail on Saul's part. It says that, that it, there's this testimony or there's this uh, that it's, it's said of him that they inquired not at the ark of God in the days of Saul. Now why is that a big deal? Can anybody tell me why that's a big deal? What does the ark of God mean to the children of Israel? Anybody? It means the presence of God. We can see that if you uh, turn to uh, Exodus 25, uh, verses 21 and 2, you don't have to turn there if you uh, can't get there quick enough. But Exodus 25 talks about this. When they are building the, when, when God is giving the instructions for uh, the, the tabernacle and everything, and he's talking about the, the ark, uh, he's giving a lot of instructions. And it refers to the ark of God as having the presence of God. Verse, uh, Exodus 25, verses 21 and 22. Says, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from above the cherubims, and which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. Uh, verse 3 says, I will meet with thee there. That is where the people would go and say, this is where God's presence is, and that's where we will go and meet with God. Exodus 30, verse 6 follows this up and says the exact same thing. In verse 6 it says, And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. God wanted his, uh, the ark of God to be uh, among the, the children of Israel. Why? Because he said, I want my presence to be among the people so they can come and they can be in my presence. They won't be able to be in the same, uh, maybe the same place, but he wanted his presence to be among his people. 
Well, what, what happened uh, when we kind of come to where we're at, we, you can start turning back to 1 Samuel. Um, is uh, at the at very end when uh, Eli was the was the uh, prophet and he was no he was the priest. Uh, there was a war that they, the the Philistines they came and there was a, there was a big battle and they fought with the Israelites and they took the Ark of the Covenant and they took it captive and it was uh, they took it captive into the land of the Philistines for about seven months and then it went back to the children of Israel. They didn't want it anymore, but they lost the Ark of the Covenant. They lost the presence of God uh, that it, because of their disobedience that. God Got taken by the enemy, but God didn't want to be there, so he he they eventually returned to like a suburb of Israel. But you know what Saul didn't do as he was king, the leader of the entire nation, he didn't prioritize bringing back the Ark of God to the, be in the middle of the people. He didn't prioritize the presence of God. You know, I'd say we need to be careful in our lives. You know, uh, young kids, uh, teenagers, uh, adults, parents, grandparents, we need to prioritize having the presence of God in our lives. You see here, David, he said, it's very important to me as the leader. Uh, you know, we, we can say that, oh, I'm not going to be a king one day. But still, we have to be careful that we don't, uh, we don't think that we don't need the presence of God. We don't need to have the testimony that Saul did. It says, you know, it's not that important. Because uh, if, uh, if you go and search the ark of God and you kind of uh, correlate it to the time that it's talking about uh, Saul, there's only one time in the, time, in the, in the, in the scripture that's, cover, or that's uh, written about him where he says, let's actually go and inquire at the Ark of God. There's one time. So in his reign, one time that it talks about him going to the Ark of God, Ark, uh, to, uh, to the presence of God, he didn't prioritize it. Uh, only one time that it's mentioned. David, he prioritized greatly the presence of God. You know what he did? He prioritized it so much that he says, you know, I want to, I built a house. He was, he, you know, we, we know that Solomon built the temple, but David did everything that he could to bring the Ark of, the, the Ark of God back to Jerusalem. He, he did everything he could to raise money to build the house of God. He was so invested into uh, bringing the Ark back. You know why? Because it represented the presence of God. He said, you know, what? It's, it's important that we place priority on this. It's important that we place priority on the presence of God. And what I'm trying to say is we don't need to just be uh, place importance on God's word. We need to place importance on being in God's presence. Yes, we can say that having God's word, we can still be in the presence of God. But do we really spend time in prayer like we should? I know that sometimes maybe it's uh, it can be more of a challenging to set aside the time that we can uh, spend in God's presence but if we look at Saul's life, he didn't place a priority on it, and it, it, it did not go well with him. He didn't uh, respond to that David did whenever he was c confronted with his sin. He didn't have the same priorities that he had. He was, David uh, was very concerned about this, and he got other people involved. Parents, are you involved with bringing your kids into the presence of God? David, uh, Saul was not really concerned of bringing the entire nation and bringing them and trying to have the presence of God be in importance. But you know what David did? He said, let's get all of Israel. It's very important that the entire nation sees this. You know, parents, we need to make sure that we prioritize maybe a prayer time. I know that sometimes that uh, maybe it's easy, uh, it talked about more here, but you know, maybe we struggle. You know, life is busy, but are we making sure that we are prioritizing family time. I know that sometimes I can struggle. We, uh, we, we can all struggle at getting busy during time, but are we prioritizing making sure our kids know that we are having time where we're in the presence of God praying as a family? Do we prioritize that? I'd say that Saul did not prioritize it. Saul did not make it a, a did not uh, invest in it as much as he did. If you uh, look, uh, he didn't prioritize uh, really much so being uh, even the word of God. There's, if you look at uh, Saul uh, would, would try to go to Samuel the prophet and he would try to uh, hear from the man of God. Sometimes what I, what I would say about that is if you had a, the prophet in those days is the prophet would give God's words to the people. He would be the, he would take God's words from God and, and he would tell it to the people. It would be like having God's word at that time. They did not have God's word, but he would hear from God and he would go tell it to the people. Saul did that occasionally. Uh, he, he, did, he did not really, uh, he, if you look at in his life, there's only about one time after uh, in, in Samuel chapter 15 or 1 Samuel 15, uh, that is the, the story with the Amalekites. 
he disobeyed. And uh, does anybody remember what, what Saul was supposed to do with the Amalekites? Does anybody know that? Any of the kids remember that Bible story? There was a fight between the Israelites and the, the children of Amalek, and they, they were given one job to do, and what did they not do? Does anybody remember? I know you do an Old Testament survey. You may have not gotten that far, but uh, d the entire uh, uh, Samuel gave Saul a, a command, says you're supposed to go and you're supposed to destroy everything, all of the animals, all of the, uh, you're, you get rid of everything, all the people, all the animals. And what the children of Israel did is they kept some of it. And after that, Saul, Saul or Samuel came to Saul and says, you disobeyed God. He says, and, uh, you know, God's renting the, uh, the kingdom away from you. And it says at the end of Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, that uh, Samuel came no more unto Saul. He, 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 he did not visit Saul until the day of his death. Uh, so Saul did not have a man of God coming to him. At the end of his life, when he was getting ready for a big battle, uh, Saul went to uh, try to hear from a man of God, but God was not listening to him. So he, uh, he, he, that was about the only time he was concerned about going to the man of God whenever there was something very big weighing on him. We need to be careful that we're not waiting for only big moments in our life to try to seek the presence of God. First Samuel uh, 15, or no, uh, towards the end of First Samuel is when that fight would, uh, when that, uh, when that was kind of coming upon him. And that's when the Philistines were getting ready to fight against uh, uh, Israel. And, and Saul, he, what did he do? He went and he, he used a witch to try to summon Samuel. The Israelites were told not to use witchcraft whatsoever. That was one of the big things. Hey, don't use witchcraft. And he went to a witch to try to summon Samuel to give him the word of God. That was the only time that he was concerned, and he went the wrong way about trying to find about the Word of God. And we have to be careful that we don't have that, that, uh, that testimony of we only look to God during the very big testing and trials in our life. We need God daily. We need God for the small things. We need God for the big things. And we have to be careful that we're not being so concerned with our own things that we miss out on the presence of God. We don't miss out on the Word of God. There's a lot of things if we look at what Saul did. He, uh, again, First Chronicles 13, we did not look at the ark of God during the days of Saul. Parents, that should not be said of us, that, you know, our kids. I'm not really sure how many times that we prayed together as a family. I'm not sure how many times that we read devotions at, together. You know, kids, you, you, you need to make sure that you're not only looking to, uh, to the Word of God for only big decisions. Teenagers that are graduating, I know there's been a lot of graduation parties and some that are coming up. You don't only look to God's presence for the big moments. We need, we need Him daily, and we have to be careful about that. Uh, the second thing that I, we're going to look at is I don't think uh, not only did Saul, he didn't really prioritize uh, seeking the Lord's presence while David did. He, he, he was very, uh, he, was, he made a very big priority in doing that. Uh, one other big thing is the, the very first time that uh, Saul, we can go to 1 Samuel 13. Uh, turn over to 1 Samuel 13. It's the very first time that Saul and David had a very big, uh, like a first big test as a king. 1 Samuel 1, uh, 13, uh, this is about a year after Saul has been king. Um, it's the very first big test that he has. 1 Samuel 13, 1 says, Now Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, uh, whereof 2,000 were uh, in one place, 1,000 were with Jonathan in another place. And, they, and basically he's starting to lead into, hey, we're getting ready to have a battle. And there's a, uh, the Philistines were gathering, they're getting ready to uh, fight against Israel. And there was a, a lot of things going on and, and it was not, uh, so this is the very first big test for Saul. Uh, and he, first, uh, verse number six says, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, they were, uh, the people, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. The, the, the Philistines, verse number five, talks about how many of them gathered. There was a lot of Philistines that were coming to fight, and there was not, uh, the Philistines outnumbered the Israelites, and they were very scared. They were very uh, troubled at what was going on. Saul is king. He's only, this is his second year as king. And he's like, hey, this is our first big test. Uh, we're coming to this point where he, uh, the people are looking to him um, as leader of the people. And uh, verse number eight, uh, it talks about, and it says, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. So what we see here is Samuel says, hey, seven days you need to wait for me. 
and they were getting ready. He was, uh, whatever Samuel was doing, I don't know. But we, we see here that God told Samuel, go to Saul and say, hey, tell Saul, wait seven days at this place for me. I'm going to come. We're going to uh, make a sacrifice unto, uh, you'll make a sacrifice unto God. And then the people will go out and they'll fight the Philistines. And most likely that's when they're going to, uh, they're going to have a victory. And but he says, you know what? You need to wait seven days. One thing uh, that we see here is uh, verse number eight says, and he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gil Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. The people are looking to Saul. He's, he's, he's in a very difficult time right now. Everyone's really scared. They're looking to him as the leader and he's, and he's waiting on Samuel to show up. He said, oh, Terry, seven days and wait for me. And he's not seeing and, and on his time clock, on his timeline, Samuel's not there. And he says, you know, what? it's been seven days. What's going on? And he's waiting. He's waiting. And, and you know how difficult it is to wait when you're waiting on God's timing? And that's, uh, that's what I'm going to see here is Saul did not uh, follow, did not wait on the, was not great at waiting on God's answer whenever he would try, uh, we'll, we'll see that. Uh, verse 9 it says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. In verse number 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. In verse 11, And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, that the Philistines had gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down uh, upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. We see here that he said, uh, God gave him a command. says, I want you to wait for me. He says, Wait. Things are difficult. Things are very, people are looking to him for uh, answers. People are looking to him to lead the people. And God says to wait. And Saul kind of got, ter Saul got uh, tired of waiting and says, you know, I'm just going to force myself to offer sacrifice. It was not Saul's job to offer that sacrifice unto the Lord. It was Samuel's job. You know, he said, uh, I can't imagine that it took him a, you know, it took some time to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. But I don't think it took a whole day to offer a sacrifice because it says in verse number uh, 10, as soon as he made an end of sacrificing unto the Lord, Samuel kind of like walks in. You know, that, well, that's one of those things where maybe a, a kids, maybe you're, uh, you're waiting for dinner and there's cookies that have just been made. And, and your mom says, hey. You can't have a cookie until after dinner. And you're like, you know, it's, you know, dinner's a long time from now. Maybe I'll just have one. And you have your hand in the cookie jar and you pull one out. And as soon as you take a bite, your mom walks in. She wasn't around, but as soon as you take a bite, she like walks in and you're caught right in the act of doing what you're not supposed to. That's exactly what happened here. Saul, Saul was told, you need to wait. I can't imagine it took him 24 hours to offer a sacrifice. Yes, maybe Samuel did not show up like exactly uh, seven days at the moment that he said he was going to. But you know what I think Saul was doing? He saw people around him. They were scared. And instead of trying to encourage them and say, hey, we need to wait on God's timing because God's timing is best. He says, I forced myself and I just had to do it. But you know what? That was the wrong timing. And he said, he was like, I got to do it myself instead of waiting on God. And that was the moment. This is the very first time where this is his like first test. And, and Samuel says to him, you know what? God is going to not make you king. You're going to lose the king and he's going to find a man that's after his own heart. Talking about David, not waiting on God's timeline, not waiting, for, not having the right patience. You know, what? whenever we're going through a difficult time, it is very difficult to have that patience, is it not? Things are looking terrible. There's a lot that's going on around you. Maybe you have kids that are looking at you. Maybe you have friends that are looking at you. Maybe the circumstances are terrible and, and, and you don't know what's going on. But you know what? God says you need to still wait on me. If he's, if he's not giving you the answer, we need to not be like Saul and says, you know, I'm going to force myself to uh, do this thing. And we need to just keep waiting on the Lord. 
We have to be careful that we're not just going to assume what God wants us to do and, 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 and do uh, and, and, and commit or make an answer or make a decision without God's peace, without God's timing. If you would turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 14, we'll see that David went through the exact, an exact same similar test when he was young into his, or when he was very uh, early on in, in his time as king, where he was asked to do the exact same test. Wait on me. You know, it, it seems there's a lot of times we go through a lot of testing and a lot of trials in our in life. That's just kind of what life is. It's not all the time. You know, we, we can go through and uh, as a king in that time, I'm sure battles were like the biggest test that they had to do. But we, it, it's not they didn't have a battle all the time. But, you know, they had battles at different times in their life. And what do they have to do uh, when they're not at battle, they have, to, they have to do what God's commanded them to do. There's a list that he gave the kings. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to copy out the, the law. You need to rule the people, answer the people. There's a lot of things that they had to do day to day. And every now and then they'd have this big time where they would be tested. And that's the time that our patience is usually tested the most. And we have to be careful that we're not, uh, we learn to have patience during those trials, during that testing. And we have to be careful that we're waiting on God to have the right answer from Him instead of just trying to do it in our own power. Because we see here in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, uh, verses 8 through 17, David, he's fighting the Philistines again. That's kind of a common enemy with Israel at that time as they are fighting the Philistines. And uh, verse 18, uh, uh, verse 10, it says, and he, and he inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up into the Philistines? And he says, Go up. And, and there's multiple different battles that are happening here. And uh, verse 13, it says, And the Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. They're going to get, getting ready for another battle. And in verse 14, it says, Therefore David inquired again of God, and God said unto him, Go not up after them, turn away from them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And it shall be when thou shalt hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go out to battle. For God has gone forth before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. In verse 16, David therefore did as God commanded him, and they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even unto Gazer. And the fame of David went out into all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations." But what do I see here is God said, hey, I'm giving you a time, uh, I'm giving you a test that you need to wait. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, again, they're battling the Philistines, and he says, you know what, instead of meeting them head on, I want you to kind of come over here, and you're just going to wait by these trees. How long are you going to wait by the trees? Until there's a noise that's made in the top of these trees. Well, how long is that going to be? He says, you know what, just wait. You know, has anybody, uh, has anybody watched those, maybe a crime show or maybe uh, a police show where they go on a stakeout, they're waiting for someone to show up either at a house or they're just trying to investigate a location? You know, if you watch those movies, when it, how long do you usually see them uh, on the stakeout? Usually like 20 seconds. Why? Because it would be pretty boring just to sit there and watch uh, people for hours as they wait for something to happen. They jump right to the office. They're like, I wonder when we're going to see this guy show up. In like five seconds, the guy shows up and it's a pretty to make the show go along quicker. We have no idea how long that, that David and the men had to sit there and wait for this noise to happen. But you know what? David had to have people looking to him and they're just sitting there. He says, you know, guys, we're going to go and we're just going to sit here. Why? Because God told me to. We're going to wait for the answer that he's going to give us. And we have to wait for this noise to go through these trees before we can go and, and attack the children, before we attack the Philistines. You know what he did? He says, wait. And he did not be like, he wasn't like Saul. And he says, you know what, I'm going to, I just forced us. We had, we, we, you know, we, we, I saw to me what was a good time to go and attack the Philistines. So I said, let's just go and do it. He said, you know, what, let's wait. And he had to wait on God's timing. And teenagers, you have to, I need, you need to wait on God's timing before you act. If you don't wait on God's timing, there's a lot of decisions that you could make in the next 10 years that could be very bad for your future. It is very important, or the, uh, a lot of you that are in here that are getting ready, to, again, there's a lot of graduations. There's a lot of th important decisions that you are going to be making over the next several years that are very important in your life. 
You don't need to just force yourself to make a decision. You need to wait on God's timing. If you don't have an answer, you need to make sure that you're in the presence of God. You're, you're not just kind of only going to Him during the, uh, even though you do need to go to Him for the big decisions, you need to be going to Him daily. Not only like, hey, uh, do I go to college or do I get a job? Uh, who do I marry? It, it, we don't only need to go to God for the very big de decisions. What I was trying to say earlier is uh, we, we know what we need to do. God has given us clear instructions what we need to do every single day. Spend time with Him, tell others about Him, spend time in His presence. Those are the things that we should prior be prioritizing. If you are obedient every single day and doing what you're supposed to, uh, spending time with God, obeying what He's told you to do, the big decisions are going to be easier to make because you're spending time with God. When, you're, when you are only going to God for the big decisions, it's going to be a lot harder. Maybe He's not going to be giving you the answer that you want to hear. But some of the times, God gives us an answer to wait, to have patience. But you know what? It's very difficult to wait and have patience. We can say, oh, it's, it's an easy thing to do. But you know what? It's probably, it's not that easy whenever it comes to it. Whenever it comes to maybe a financial decision, a health decision, whether it's uh, whatever decisions you're going to be making, there's a lot of things that we have to wait on God's timing for. And there's people in the Bible that did not wait on God's timing like David did here where he was waiting for this sound and uh, the sound in the mulberry trees. One big example I can think of of someone not waiting on God's timing. Could, I, let's see if anyone can guess. Is anyone, can anyone guess an example of someone not waiting on God's timing and causing a really big problem that I'm thinking of? Anyone got an example? Anybody want to take a guess? What would you say? That's what I was thinking of. Abraham and Isaac. You know what happened with, with Abraham? He was told, you're going to have a son. You know how many years he waited till that fulfillment came? He waited a lot of years. I think he was uh, 70. I think he had Isaac when he was close to 100. He probably waited like 25, 30 years for God to give him the right answer. But you know what he did before that? He tried to rush. He said, you know what? You know, God's, not, God's not really answering this in, in my timeline. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, he had uh, Ishmael. And you know what? That caused a lot of problems. And guess what? I, it's still causing problems today because he was trying to rush God's timeline. He says, you know, God has a plan, but I just don't think God's timing is right. You know, it's very dangerous if we, don't, if we start thinking that God's timeline is not the right timeline. We, whenever we hear God say, wait, we just want to hear the answer. We want to we have the answer right now. There's a lot of things. We, are, we, are, we can't have anything that we want in two days with Amazon Prime shipping. That's probably not helped us in our day and age. We can, have, we can have whatever we want within like two days. But you know what? God doesn't always work in that. You know, God, I'm, I'm praying for this. I'd like an answer in two days. And to be honest, I want this answer. That'd be great. And we try to tell them what we want, when we want it. And that's not how God operates. Young people, that is not how God operates, and we have to be careful. We, we need to be seeking God daily and, and waiting on His timeline, because guess what? When we rush His timeline, we run into problems. Even though uh, with Saul that God still uh, uh, delivered the Philistines into His hand and still gave them the victory, uh, the kingdom was t taken away from Saul. Even though Abraham did have Isaac uh, when, whenever uh, uh, he finally fulfilled his promise to uh, Abraham by giving him Isaac, guess what? He caused a lot of problems with Ishmael and with a lot of the uh, that we still are seeing today because of the descendants of Ishmael. When we try to rush God's timing, we have a lot of problems that come in it. You know, God, we have t we're going to have testing points in our life. We all have it. God wants us to have patience. You know, we need, we need to wait on Him and His timing. And we need to be like David, and we need to prioritize the presence of God and the Word of God, and not just be like Saul that says you know, that he didn't... We don't want to have the testimony that says, you know, we didn't really seek God's... Uh, the, 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 we didn't seek the presence of God during, during His time. You don't want to have that testimony. Have the testimony that David did where he said, you know, I'm going to make it a priority and I'm going to get everybody involved in seeing God's presence. I'm going to wait on God's timing because you know what? Trying to rush God and rush his timing and not doing, obeying him, it's going to cause a lot of problems. Now we're out of time. We're going, to, we're going to end and then we're going to be dismissed. But whatever, what, children, wait on, you need to wait on God's timing.
parents, we need to lead our kids, lead our families in coming to the presence of God and waiting on His timeline. Uh, teenagers, there's a lot of things happening. You need to be seeking God's presence and waiting on Him and His answers, even when it doesn't make sense. Because you know what? There's a lot of things in life that aren't going to make sense. But if we wait on God, it's going to turn out right, and we're going to be able to see how He worked and give Him the praise for it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for the time that we've had this morning to open your word and just see a few things from uh, Saul and David. Please just help us to apply that to our lives. Lord, please work as you see fit. Please be with the next hour uh, as we go and we sing uh, praise to you and hear your word preached. Lord, help us to uh, give you the honor and glory.